I'm looking at two post-9-11 nonfiction books that I read as testimonial texts. Testimony because they bear witness to a tragedy. They give an account of a real person's traumatic experience. And in doing so, they seem to be in need for constantly justifying this project, for claiming immediate access and truthful and authentic reporting. In that context, I'm particularly interested in how these texts handle the realness of the lives they portray and how they locate their narratives within a larger social context. In Rebecca Sklut's New York Times bestseller, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, this is the realm of bioethics, specifically patients' consent in medical research. In Dave Eggers' American Book Award winner, Cytoon, the context is the hostility against Arab Americans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. The two popular, highly acclaimed books invite comparison, not just because both are works of literary journalism that unravel a personal trauma. More intriguingly, the ethical project that the authors engage in poses certain challenges to them. First of all, when it comes to their own involvement in the narratives they create. Secondly, when one considers the controversies over the social issues they address. So that finally, they seem to struggle with unease when it comes to their own place in the political discussion they more or less willingly locate themselves in. All of these challenges are somewhat connected to the chosen form, testimony. As the genre requires an engagement with reality or even a political positioning, one might argue. Thus, I argue that while Sklut reduces the political power of her narrative to the individual exceptional story, Eggers expands it to make a larger point about social injustice. Let me give you a very brief summary of each of the works. In her 2010 book, The Immortal Life, Sklut tells the story of a famous case in US medical history. She reconstructs the life of a poor African-American woman, Henrietta Lacks, who died of cervical cancer in the early 1950s. A sample of her body tissue was taken without her knowledge or consent and proved an extremely important contribution to medicine. Unlike previous human tissue samples, her cells did not die but multiplied endlessly. The cell culture, named HeLa, was and up to this day is still used in myriad medical fields throughout the world. But it was not until the late 1970s that her family learned about the billion dollar Gila industry. Naturally, they were shocked and felt deceived. The family's struggle of finding out what happened to their relative forms a large portion of the book, mainly driven by Lack's daughter, Deborah, who helps the author on her journalistic quest. Dave Eggers's Saitoun from 2009 centers on Abdul Rahman Saitoun, a Syrian American who owns a painting company in New Orleans. When Hurricane Katrina hits in 2005, he chooses to stay in the city to take care of the family's property while his wife and the children leave for a safer place. In the days after the storm, Saitoun travels the city in a canoe, rescuing neighbors and feeding the dogs that have been left behind. His life fundamentally changes when police and National, Gu National Guard arrest him at one of his own houses. Without any wrongdoing and without being charged with a crime or any explanation, he is put in an open-air makeshift prison, a Guantanamo-like construction, before being transferred to a correctional facility. He is denied a phone call, a lawyer, and medical help for three more weeks. Kathy, his wife, is eventually able to locate him, but she is not allowed to visit or to testify on his behalf in the court hearing. Finally, charges are dropped, and the suspected terrorist is released. In my comparison of the two books, I'll first discuss the two texts as testimonial writing and will sketch the traumas they record. Moving from trauma at the content level, I will then draw your attention to how these texts work as narratives with a focus on the author's involvement. In a third step, I will highlight how both books use strategies outside of the text to further the ethical issues they want to address. With this analysis, I try to show that their approaches differ quite dramatically and that they eventually try to utilize the political powers of their stories to different ends. 
From a trauma perspective, testimonies are first-person accounts that are true to the individual's lived experiences. These experiences are so severely disruptive that the act of testifying itself often represents a physical or psychological survival. But testimony also involves the other side. A listener needs to be empathetic and understanding, but at the same time to acknowledge the incommensurability that is the complete otherness of the story he or she bears witness to. How then can Sklud and Eggers testify if they are not the survivors themselves? I propose the idea that they testify vicariously to the traumas of others. They give a personal account on behalf of those, this is what the books suggest, those that cannot tell their own stories of injustice and hardship. Hence, I call them testimonies by proxy. In The Immortal Life, Sklud gives an account of Lex's life and the legacy of herself. She reconstructs a chain of unfortunate events that is, um, her, that is the troubled childhood, the lady's much too late medical treatment, her suffering and painful death at the hospital, and the, the way her body was objectified, her tissue taken and commercialized without her knowledge or consent. The book also portrays her children's belated struggle to come to terms with these events and to understand the uncanniness of their mother's ever-present cells. It thus records various instances of trauma at the individual as well as the intergenerational level. The testimonial project, however, is complicated by the fact that the author barely comments on the many instances of trauma that emerge from structural inequalities, such as sexual violence, poverty, racism, after all, we're talking about a black woman in Virginia in the 1950s. Instead, the book focuses on the tragic success of the cells. Deplorable, the book argues, because Lack's contribution to medicine has never really been, been acknowledged and has never been compensated for. Even though the author is somewhat blind to the role of race, gender, and class, the book nevertheless allows glimpses at how segregation and further deprivations contribute to a particular vulnerability or disempowerment and forms of subjection that must be understood as a constant exposure to trauma. Eggers' book similarly attests to Saitun's victimization and the xenophobia he encountered. Much like the other book, it is a proxy testimony that bears witness on behalf of an individual who lacks the means and access to tell a story and make the injustice he endured public. In the text, it becomes clear that much more than the devastating effects of the hurricane, the water, the flooding, it's really humans that cause the character's helplessness, the loss of one's livelihood, and the loss of trust in the existing order. The book thus allows insights into a general post-9-11 discrimination against Muslim Americans. This hostility was amplified during the post-Katrina state of emergency, which enabled an abuse of power and served as an excuse for the unfair treatment and the deprivation of rights that Saitun, like many others, experienced. Labeled a terrorist, he was arrested and imprisoned without respect to basic human rights. Not only that, the reader learns of the degrading practices of the prison guards that were meant to strip him of his dignity and a fear for his life. Eggers, unlike Sklut, refrains from commenting and leaves it to the facts to speak to this character's traumatization and ensuing disillusionment with the legal system in the U.S. A closer look at their form brings into sharper focus how the books negotiate the reality of the events they testify to. Both are works of literary journalism that grapple with the genre conventions of life writing and with the certain ethical awareness that their topic requires. To be precise, there is a tension between how they insist on telling the unmediated truth on one hand and how they want to narrate a compelling story on the other. For instance, both texts make use of inserted photographs and explanatory notes. Moreover, the authors give credit to other researchers and the sources where they got their information from. At the same time, even though the books mark themselves as nonfiction accounts of the lives of real people, they employ literary strategies. This is because testimonial writing, as well as any other text that reconstructs a real event, involves processes of selecting, arranging, and emphasizing material, as well as using narrative frames and tropes and rhetorical figures and so on. So it shares its operations with fiction writing. 
in the immortal life, the fictional strategies, in fact, jeopardize, jeopardize the book's testimonial project. Sclut becomes so immersed that the borders between author and character become blurry. This entanglement eventually conflicts with the ethical task of being empathetic, but at the same time acknowledging the very otherness of Lexus and her family's experiences. Throughout the text, Luke claims unmediated, investigative, and professional reporting. This professional distance, however, becomes smaller and smaller so that in the end, she becomes a character in her own text. And the roles of witness and testifier, self and other, overlap. For instance, toward the end of the book, Sklut goes to church with Deborah and is made to testify before the congregation. And here's the author talking. My throat clenched as Deborah pushed my back to get me moving. I walked to the pulpit and took the microphone from Pullum, the preacher, who patted me on the back and whispered in my ear, just preach it in your own words. So I did. I told the story of Henrietta Sells and what they'd done for science. My voice growing louder as the congregation yelled, Amen and Hallelujah. Sleuth's speech engages the audience emotionally, in a double way, through as well as within the text. As a performance, it seeks approval of her work by the local black community. The textual record of this quite self-dramatizing performance aims to increase the credibility of her writing and the high-minded motives of the project and confirms herself as a primary protagonist in the story. We understand here that the book is as much about Lex as it is about a heroic journalist writing it. Heroism is also a problem in Eggers' book, but here it does not refer to the author. Actually, we hardly notice the narrator at all. Eggers remains invisible, neither commenting on the events nor staging or aggrandizing his work as Lute does. The gestures of truthfulness appear outside of the narrative. A preface statement tells us that, quote, all the facts have been confirmed by independent sources and that the book solely represents one family's experiences and that it reflects their view of the events." End quote. In an interview, Eggers mentioned that he sent the manuscript to the Cytoons for six or seven reads. This collaboration will later on become problematic. When it turns out that his main character is charged with battery, was convicted, and went to jail in 2012, where he plotted the murder of his now ex-wife, Kathy. This caused a media controversy in which Eggers was accused of misrepresenting Zaytun's personality. Yet, is this a fair charge? After all, the recent developments don't really change anything about Zaytun's experiences during the hurricane. Furthermore, if his violent behavior had already started during the writing of the book, Kathy had not reported it then. But the criticism remains. Eggers painted the picture of a noble man, which in retrospect becomes irreconcilable with his history of domestic violence. A quote from Salon.com reads, Eggers' Saitoon is a heroic and selfless creation. Where am I? Selfless creation, kind and gentle, and his detainment by the authorities makes for a beautiful tale of injustice. But now, a far more complex Saitoon has walked off the page without a political and moral agenda, borderless and uncontainable. Another critic says, the criminal charges against Saitoon make me question almost everything Eggers has ever written and raise numerous questions like, did Eggers ignore aspects of Saitoon's personality because they didn't suit his narrative? She also rejects the author's statement on his website in which he expresses his deep um, empathy for Kathy, claiming that he owes his many readers a real explanation. She goes on, there's so much detail in Saitoon, and yet the book now seems very thin to me. Rather than thinking about what's in the book, I'm more intrigued by what isn't. Interesting enough, the author is here held liable for what the character was doing outside the text. In brief, both Skludes as well as Eggers' book grapple with the responsibilities and genre expectations of testimony. That is, the truth claims, the balance between empathy and distance, disinterestedness and journalistic immersion, and even a sense of accountability, uh, which became visible in the last example. And finally, I'd like to comment on the book's politics. As the traumas they testify to are tied to broader social issues, they also need to somehow position themselves toward these issues. I already mentioned that Sklut expresses much of her views on who's to blame or rather not to blame in the narrative, in the text itself. Sklut is a science writer and um, her sympathies uh, rather lie with the research community. 
In Cytoon, we don't find statements of this kind. Both of the books, however, are surrounded by some interesting paratexts, such as film adaptations that are in the making. But there is another format, more telling, in terms of the political alignment of their projects. Each of the authors has established a foundation that goes along with the book. Let's first have a look at the Henrietta Lacks Foundation. Since the main complaint of the book is that the family never received any compensation, whereas the cells made this worldwide industry and numberless careers possible, the foundation was established for the family, specifically to provide health insurance and pay for tuition for Lacks' grandchildren. The scope changed in the following year. We learned from the website that now it gives grants to people unjustly treated by medicine who personally didn't benefit from donating their blood or body tissue. The expansion notwithstanding, this seems like quite a limited agenda as it tries to help a very narrow group of people and does not address any larger issues. I'm thinking here of health disparities that are at the core not only of laxes but generally of poor people's situations. One critic actually called the foundation neoliberal because it does not provide for the needy but only for those who also contributed to society in the first place. I would add that the foundation, helped by clever marketing, also increases the sales of the book. It makes the book appear even more ethical than it already presents itself in the text. If we now turn to Agris' project, we learn on the first page of the book that, quote, all author proceeds from this book go to the Saitoon Foundation dedicated to rebuilding New Orleans and fostering interfaith understanding, end quote. Here it differs from Sklut's foundation. Hers is only partially supported by some proceeds from the sale of a book and actively advertises private donations via the website. A second difference is how the Saitoon Foundation gives grants to community initiatives, such as the Muslim Student Association, churches, legal support groups, and environmental groups. Here the PR effect seems to be less pronounced for the sake of addressing social ills and human rights violations that the written text records but refrains from giving an interpretation of. To conclude, this was my very brief comparative sketch of the two nonfiction books uh, that give a personal account of trauma, both reflect and negotiate the genre conventions, reader expectations, and challenges of testimonial writing. They seem to be aware of the ethical significance of their projects, but follow slightly different political trajectories, which the work of their foundations um, illustrates. Sklut curtails the cultural potency of her narrative to tell a story of an exceptional individual presenting trauma and redress as personal matters. In contrast, seeking to address xenophobia and to warn readers of uh, maybe a possible police state mentality, Agus's book implicates more than just one man's story, this becomes also visible in the more inclusive and local way that profits are distributed. Thank you.